God's grace and his mercy are yours. Given to you through the work of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let's start out today by testing your memory. They say your memory is sharpest. Right about now, between about 8 and 11, your memory is sharpest. Let's see how your memory is. Do you remember what you were doing on November 8th of last year? You lived through it. You had the whole day. Do you remember what you did November 8th of last year? Joy says she knows. Mm. <laughs> Maybe not. Probably not, right? Most likely not. Do you remember where you were November 8th of 2016? Oh, hmm. I bet you you do. That is when we had our election. And that is when we elected two major new leaders to help lead our country. We had Donald J. Trump as the leader and now president of our nation. And we elected Nancy Pelosi to, uh, for another term. And she, soon after, became the Speaker of the House, third in line for the presidency. And with that, that was a shocking thing. And since then, if I can editorialize a little bit here, uh, our country has changed into what they call team politics. Have you heard that? Team politics? It means that, you know, let, let's see a quick show of hands. How many of you are Viking fans? Okay, and the rest of you Packer fans, I'm sure? We all have our favorite teams, right? And each other thinks the other person is ridiculous. How would I ever, born and grown up in Green Bay, how could I ever want to be a Viking fan, right? And you Viking fans think that is just ridiculous. That's what we have now in our country. And so, as you look at this, you are probably part of team politics. You are looking at one of those photos and saying, that's my leader. I don't know which one, but you're looking and saying, that's the person that I, I like the most. And that person next to it, you probably are thinking is absolutely ridiculous. I cannot wait. So that person next to my person gets elected out. And with that, that's the world we are living in. It's becoming more and more polarizing. More and more where we have now the chance to say terrible things about people that are in opposition to us. If you're a Republican, you have every right to say terrible things about a Democrat. And if you're a Democrat, you have every right to do things and say things about a Republican. Because you're right. And this is your team. And your team needs to win. Well, that's the world we live in, but we're in God's house today. And so we want to hear what God has to say about this. So we're today, for our sermon study, we're going to go to the book of Daniel. Daniel is an Old Testament prophet, and Daniel is a little bit different than most Old Testament prophets. You see, Daniel was the one that was left behind when all of his countrymen were taken away. Remember real quickly what happened in the Old Testament. Everything builds up and is a pinnacle with King David and Solomon. They are a superpower. The nation of Israel is the strongest it has ever been. And then soon after that, they start turning away. They start worshiping false idols. They start worshiping false gods. They start ignoring God. And God finally is saying, you guys keep this up, and I'm going to lift my hands up. I'm going to lift my hands up, and these other nations are going to swoop in and take you away. All this time, I'm the one defending you and making sure that it doesn't happen. But if you guys don't listen to me, I'm going to shake you guys awake. I'm just going to let them come in. And that's exactly what happens. And so nations come in, one of them led by King Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to hear a lot about him in a little bit, comes in and carts away God's people. But with that, he makes sure that the, the nation that Nebuchadnezzar is leading, he has, now that he's occupying Israel, he has the best and the brightest stay. They don't have to get carted away. They get to stay and help him lead. And so Daniel, now one of the best and brightest of the time, is in a way promoted up to prime minister of this occupying nation. Now, the Israelites fell into the trap that we fall into. That because God did this, you know, God doesn't care about us anymore. God isn't active anymore. And what the situation today is, is never going to change. And yet, when you read the Old Testament, this is what always God has promised. I allowed this to happen. I allowed it for your good because I care about you. This is not going to be like this forever. 
There will be a day when I will take this problem away from you. That's our hope. That's the thing that we cling to every single day. And yet that is what God's people were being told by Daniel. Now, with that, here we have King Nebuchadnezzar, who now has taken over and uh, occupied what we call Israel, has defeated God's people. And as you can imagine, his height of arrogance is off the charts. There is nobody more arrogant or more feeling more powerful or feeling more like there is God on earth than King Nebuchadnezzar. And you can understand why. We talked a little bit about this in our Bible study. You can understand why. If I've defeated God's army, if I've defeated God's people, well, I've defeated God. And if I've defeated God, then I am the most powerful man in the world. Well, again, God is not going to allow this to happen forever. And so God uses Daniel, who has risen up to be about prime minister. So he's got the ear of King Nebuchadnezzar. And with that, God gives dreams to King Nebuchadnezzar. The first three chapters uh, talk about this in Daniel. And the dreams are to the effect of, you need, to humil- you need to have some humility here. You need to bow to the true Lord who allowed this to happen. Because there is going to be a day when he changes his mind, and you better be on the right side of God. Humble yourself, repent, turn, and you will find grace with God. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about this, and he doesn't understand it. Wouldn't you know who's able to help and interpret is? Daniel. Well, Daniel goes and tells him all these things that are going to happen, that God is going to humiliate you, that God is going to humble you, that you're going to realize who is the one that put power into your life, who is the one that gave you all these blessings. It is God. Now is the time to turn. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar does? What do all arrogant people do? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. First off, you are no dream. Uh, you, you don't know how to interpret dreams. You're a pretty bad dream interpreter. Second off, there's nothing God can do to me. I defeated his army. How, what can he possibly do to me? And that's where we pick up our text. So please feel free to follow along. We're going to spend a little time here in our Bible study, in our sermon, in Daniel chapter 4. So after this, after he interprets his dream and he is literally laughed off stage, Daniel, then we have this exact moment in Scripture. All of this now happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, so he kicks him out, laughs at Daniel, and this goes on now. He's walking around with his arrogance for 12 months. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? So if there's anybody wrong here, it was Daniel. I'm the one that did this. Daniel, who who said these crazy things to me a year ago, look at all I've created. Look at how great I am. Look at how majestic I am. I am God walking on earth. I am pretty awesome. Verse 31, the words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has now been taken from you. Not going to take it away tomorrow. I'm not going to take it away in a week. I'm not going to slowly allow uh, armies to come in and you're going to start losing battles. It's been taken from you right now. So with that, the Lord now strikes him with a disease, a mental disease. This is, how, this is what God says is going, to, is going to happen to him. Verse 32. From now on, you will be driven away from people, and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat cattle like, or you will eat grass like cattle. So he's going to be hit with a mental disease. That I, I, I hope I pronounce this right. Uh, L-Y-C-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-Y, Lincolnthropy, Lycanthropy. All right, you learned something from uh, faith today. Lycanthropy, that is a mental condition where you actually think you are an animal. So with that, King Nebuchadnezzar is now on his feet, crawling around. This once king that just five minutes ago was feeling he was God on earth is now crawling around eating grass. So, 
Seven times will pass for you. So this is going to happen for quite a while. For you until what? Until you acknowledge what? That the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. So the Lord is going to allow this to happen until what? Until you come to your senses and you realize that you are created. God is the creator. Until you realize that God rules and you don't rule with anything more than what God gives you. That God is God and you are not. Verse 33, immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. And then soon after that, indeed, he was driven away from people and he ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. How long did this go on? How long did Nebuchadnezzar fail to repent? Quite a while. He's got now long flowing hair. He's got now talons, you know, fingernails that look like talons. It took that long for him to come to his senses. So long of arrogance he was hanging on to this that this was going on for months, maybe even years. Suddenly, the most powerful man of the world is now reduced to going on his hands and knees, eating grass, actually believing he is an animal. Now, with that, Nebuchadnezzar is given some details about this whole situation. The Holy Spirit allows Nebuchadnezzar to sort of, uh, we get to peek into his diary during this time. Verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, then, I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of his earth. Look at what he is now confessing. I am merely one of God's servants. I am merely one of God's people. God is the one that is ruling all this. God is the one with his hands on all the strings. God is the one that rules over the earth, not me. I rule only because God gave it to me. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what is this that you have done? So Nebuchadnezzar realizes finally that there is no one greater than God, that there is no one more powerful than God, that as powerful as he is, it still does not compare to, the, to what God has done. And he finally realizes that it is God who gave him this authority, God who gave him these abilities, it was God who gave him this opportunity. And therefore, God is the one that re- deserves respect and worship and honor. Once he recognizes this, verse 36, at the same time that my at that at that same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar, through this whole situation, finally realizes the huge takeaway of the day and that he, is under, he understands that he is king, but God is God. He is powerful, but that power comes from God and is only reserved ultimately for God. He is to be honored, but God is to be worshipped. Okay, what does this have to do with us? Let me tell you what this has to do with us. Three things. I think God wants you to leave here realizing that we live in a world where we are involved in team politics. You probably consider yourself a Democrat or a Republican. But I think the first thing God wants you to realize today is that it really doesn't matter who is ruling in the White House, who is ruling in Congress, who is your boss, who is the mayor, ultimately, who is in charge? God is in charge. God is more powerful than all. God is the one that is to be worshipped. God is the one that is allowing these people to have power for God's good for a period of time. 
So with that, we have some things. We, we have to ask ourselves. Let's go to first, or, uh, Psalm 146. Do you believe this? Do, do you believe this? Do you believe that, uh, that we should not put trust in princes and mortal men who cannot save? When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Is this something that you believe? Do you believe that I'm not going to put trust in princes? I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. Because the Lord was willing to send his son to die for me. The Lord was willing to come and live a life I couldn't live. He was willing to credit me with his perfection. He was the one that was willing to change my eternity through baptism, through coming to faith. He was the one that was willing to do all that. He was the one able to do that. And so I'm not going to put my trust in princes. I'm not going to put my trust in my president. I'm not going to put my trust in my ultimate trust goes to the Lord. Do you believe this? What about this? Romans 13. Do you actually believe this? That there is no authority except that which God has established and that authorities that exist have been established by God. Do you believe this? Do you believe that God put Donald Trump as president according to his good? He is powerful enough to do this. Do you believe that Nancy Pelosi is in charge of one half of Congress because God ordained it and wanted it? Because that's what it says. Do you believe this? I think all of us would say, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I believe this. Okay, um, do we show that to others? Is that how we live? Is that the words that come from our mouth when we talk about the opposing political party? Is that the way we talk about our Democrat friend if we're a Republican? Is that the way we talk about a Republican friend or a president if we're a Democrat? See, we live in a world where it is easy because we have political parties to have team politics, and with that, you get to now say anything you want about your opponent. You get to type anything you want about your opponent. You get to say things that you would never say to someone else, but you get to say that because they're a Democrat or a Republican. Where God would say, you know who you sound like? You sound like Nebuchadnezzar. Sounding like you don't recognize that God is in control of all things. It sounds like you are putting your trust in princes instead of the one that came for you. Instead of the one that was willing to go to a cross and be tried by a government he probably didn't vote for. He was willing to undergo that so that you could be saved. Even forgiven of the times when we say things about other people that we shouldn't. Last place I want to ask you and take you to is John 13. And this is when Jesus is together with his disciples up in the upper room. He is literally away from being arrested by a government he didn't vote for, by a government that we would say is sinful, and yet you don't see Jesus saying terrible things about them. In fact, he is following the Father's will, and this is what he says to his disciples. He says, a new command I give to you. This is what he's saying to you, by the way. A new command I give to you, since you probably consider yourself one of Jesus' disciples. A new command I'm giving to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, I copied and pasted that from an on-screen, from a Bible program. I did not out-edit, I did not edit anything out. I didn't edit out anything that said, love one another as long as you agree with them. As I have loved you, you must love one another as long as you vote the same way as someone else. What God is saying is, love that person, no matter what they think, no matter what they believe. Now you might be thinking, but pastor, it's, it's terrible out there. You don't realize the things that they have said. Let God handle that. You handle you. You do you. You can affect a person by the way that you talk about them, the way you speak about them. You can affect a person by the way that you honor your president and honor your congressman and honor your boss. You can affect the way and show yourself to be different. And when you do, when you do not uh, belittle somebody, when you don't sin with your words or the way that you type, well, now you are reflecting Jesus. Now you are making him look good. Now you are realizing that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. 
It is the Lord that has given me these people in authority for my good. I might understand it. I might not. But whenever I give them honor, whenever I give them my, uh, my, my best, I'm also going to give, though, my Lord my worship. He gets my love. He gets my praise. And when I do that, I'm recognizing that it is Jesus who is the King of kings. It is Jesus who is the Lord of lords. It is Jesus who is the only Savior and only God. It is Jesus who is in control of our lives. It is the one that went to the cross to make sure that he is in control of our eternal destiny. Let's go to our Lord and let's close our sermon study here by going to him in prayer. Lord God, King of kings, Lord of lords, we thank you for the reminder today as we live in a world of bosses and senators and presidents. Through this reminder today, let us be reminded that you want us to give honor to our president, no matter who he is, but not the highest honor. That goes to you. We are to give our government respect, but not the greatest respect. That goes to you. We are to pray for and support our leaders, but our faith and our honor and our worship are reserved only for you, O Lord, because our Lord Jesus did what no government or boss or president could ever do. He is the one that defeated sin. He is the one that defeated our eternal death. He is the one that defeated Satan for us. So Lord, hear us now as we come together and in a faith-filled response repeat the confession of Nebuchadnezzar, the once mighty king who learned that you, God, is and always will be in control. We praise you and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Amen. Amen.